And good morning. This is Eau Claire Baptist Church. We are glad and excited that you're worshiping with us today. So let's begin our worship as we join the praise team as we sing In Christ Alone. As the team comes up, I wanted to remind you that we want you to sing along with us. Our chief um, technology lady who's up in the balcony, y'all don't get to see her on Sunday mornings until after the service, but she says that we needed to understand that since we've started singing with the words up here in the choir loft, that everybody's head's up instead of down in a book, and she actually hears us singing and thinks it's a wonderful thing. So we, want to, we don't want to disappoint her. How about um, join, stand and join us in, in Christ alone? Yeah. 
Father, we're grateful for this day of worship. Lord, we do thank you for the power of Jesus Christ who conquered death, burial, and the grave. We're grateful today that the resurrection is still as true today as it was last Sunday. And so, Lord, we have gathered together today to honor you, to celebrate you, to worship you. And we ask, dear Lord, as we draw near to you today, would you please draw near to us? And we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said together, amen. Well, thank you. You can be seated. Thank you so much, praise team, for leading us in worship. I'm so glad you're here today as we worship the Lord together. And so for those of you joining us in person and for those of you joining us online, whether now or later, we are so glad to have you as we worship the Lord together. Uh, before this next hymn, there are just a couple of church announcements that I want to make in the life of our church family. About four of these. So first, I want to remind you today at 4 p.m., George Bullard, our Director of Missions for the Columbia Metro Baptist Association, will be meeting with us. And he'll be walking us through some discussions concerning a visioning process for the life of our church. And so I'm asking that our church council and deacons please uh, make every, every effort to attend today at four. And this is also open to any church member who has interest in the future of our church family. So that will be today at four. We anticipate about a 90 minute meeting and I hope you can make it to that today. Light refreshments will also be served for that. I uh, wanna let you know coming up next Sunday, we will have a special guest missionary who will be with us traveling all the way from the Middle East uh, in Israel. And so I'm excited for that. And I'll tell you more about that as we get closer to Sunday. So I hope you'll make plans to be here with us next Sunday for that. And then coming up later in May, our youth have scheduled a barbecue fundraiser for May the 14th. And so if you would like to purchase tickets for that, uh, you can see Richard during the fellowship after service today. And then one other quick announcement, I just want to let you know this Wednesday is Administrative Professionals Day. And so I just want to say a word to Julia. We want to thank you so much for all you do for the life and ministry of our church. And so uh, for the rest of us Wednesday, if you would be mindful of that and any way you'd like to express your appreciation to Julia, I encourage you to do that. So Julia, we thank God for you and celebrate Administrative Professionals Day with you. All right, I think that's it by way of announcements. And so we'll sing, stand and sing uh, this first hymn, hymn number 161. Uh, then the puppets will lead us. After the puppets, Ms. Sharon will be glad for our children ages five and under to be dismissed with her. And then we'll sing the next hymn after that as well. Stand with us as we sing, please.
Thank you. Let's be seated. And it's time now for the puppets. Oh, dear. This is getting ridiculous. I remember when you could buy a whole can of these for a nickel. Hi, Mr. Quimper. Oh, hi, Herb. Can I talk to you a minute? Sure, Mr. Quimper, but I'm kind of in a hurry. Oh, you busy? Well, no. My mom just told me to come right home from the store. Oh, well, I just wanted to say that we've missed you in Sunday school the last couple of weeks. Oh, thanks, but I probably won't be there for a while. I have a job washing Mr. Kerman's car on Sundays. Hmm, what's wrong, Herb? Did your dad lose his job? No, I'm trying to earn money so I can buy myself a new baseball glove. My old one got stolen. Working on Sundays for a baseball glove? Well, it's the only time he'll let me do it, and he gives me a dollar each time. Besides, it's the only job I could find. But Herb, what about Sunday school? I'm sorry, Mr. Quimper, but I really need this glove. There's other ways to go about getting one, Herb. Yeah, like what? Well, the Bible says, give first place to God and his kingdom, and he'll give you the other things you need. Wow, you mean I won't have to work for it? No, Herb. I mean, if you try and do what God wants you to, then he'll provide other ways of getting the things you need. Oh, you mean like coming to Sunday school? That's right. Maybe if Mr. Kerman sees that it's important to you to be at church, he'll find another time for you to wash his car. You think so? It's possible. Anyway, what's more important, learning about God or buying a baseball glove? Well, when you put it that way, I guess God is more important. I'll be in Sunday school on Sunday. Good boy. Well, you'd better hurry if you don't want to get in trouble. Oh, yeah. I almost forgot. Bye, Mr. Quimper. See you Sunday. Bye, Herb. Let's see. Have I got everything? Milk, bread, butter. Oh, I almost forgot the peanut butter. Let's see now. Where's that? Thank you, puppets. And now it's time for our next hymn, so I invite you to stand as we sing Fairest Lord Jesus.
Thank you. Let's be seated now. If you have a Bible with you today, our scripture reading is from Revelation chapter 3. Today we finish the series we've been working through on the seven churches of Revelation. And the scripture today is Revelation 3 verses 14 through 22. And the text says this. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. Verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And then verse, thir verse 22, that phrase that we've heard so often says this, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. May God bless the reading of his word today and uh, before we pray together, there are three prayer needs in the life of our church I want to make sure you're aware of. Uh, first of all, I failed to include this in the email that I sent out earlier, uh, but we do want to add Wesley Dickerson to the prayer list. Uh, Wesley had a fall off of a ladder on Wednesday, uh, a couple of broken bones in his back, so please lift Wesley to the Lord. Also, just an update on Miss Bobby Cato. Uh, her daughter-in-law, Roz, says that Miss Bobby did get a new back, or excuse me, new neck brace. Uh, she has to wear that for another two to four weeks, and she will go for another cat cat scan on May the 9th. And uh, Roz let us know that Bobby said she is doing the best she can. So please continue to lift Miss Bobby to the Lord. I plan on seeing her after service today. And then we are also praying for Sandra Porter as she recovers. Uh, she had her surgery also Wednesday. Uh, so please pray for Sandra as she recovers. Uh, the doctor felt really good about removing the tumor off of her eardrum and did not see any need for concern there. So please continue lifting Sandra up as she recovers. As we pray today, I know you have your needs as well, and I invite you to take your needs to the Lord. And if you would, please bow with me as we pray together today. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful that you do hear us when we pray. And Lord, we've come together today to call upon your name. Father, we're mindful of the needs we've spoken of today. Lord, we're also mindful of unspoken needs weighing heavy, perhaps, in each of our hearts, in each of our lives. And today, Lord, we are grateful that you invite us to cast all of our cares upon you, for you tell us that you care for us. We thank you for this. Would you hear now, Lord, our prayer as we lift our voices to you and speak to our hearts. We pray during this time of silent prayer and meditation as we lift our prayer together in Jesus' name.
people said together, amen. Thank you, Fred and Joe, for leading us in worship today. Thank you, Amanda, for getting the message out as well. And so we're in Revelation chapter 3, and uh, this perhaps as the last of the seven churches that we'll look at today and in our series that we've shared in really since uh, January of this year. So I hope it's been a blessed series for you. I'm really excited about all we've learned together and I trust God's word will take deep root in our lives as his church, as his bride. And today uh, perhaps is uh, one of the most startling messages that we read about in the in the message to the seven churches of Revelation. As I followed along uh, in the MacArthur commentary series, I've leaned heavily upon uh, the study notes uh, by John MacArthur on the seven churches of Revelation. And so using his outline today as one that has carried us through the study of these seven churches. And look with me first at the correspondent, and we see this in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, as we have seen for all of the other six churches, uh, we're always told who it is that is writing or who it is that is speaking this message to the churches. And the case for the seventh church is the same as it has been. And we see in verse 14 that as is the case with the other six churches, it is the Lord Jesus who is speaking to his church. God is giving the message to the Lord Jesus. And in turn, the Lord Jesus is giving the message directly to the Apostle John, who is then writing the message of what John is hearing and sending this message forth to the seven churches listed here. And in verse 14, we see three quick characteristics about the one who is giving the message. And he says this to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this. And so here, as is the case with the previous six churches, we see that it is the Lord Jesus himself that is speaking this message to the church of Laodicea. And we know this because of the three characteristics we have just read. The first is this, the amen. And so this tells us the word amen is a word that means true, or we've heard it translated in other translations of where Jesus has said, perhaps, verily, verily, I say unto you, or truly, truly, I say unto you. And this reminds us that the one giving the message is indeed the God of all truth. He is the Amen. This tells us that our Lord is firm. He is fixed. He is certain. He is faithful. He is unchangeable. Because He is true in every way and because all He says is true, all He promises is is true all of his covenants are true and he himself is the guarantee of our affirmation and everything we read here is absolutely true and guaranteed by God himself through the Lord Jesus who is the amen and so this reminds us of, if you'd like to jot down a quick verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 tells us this, For all the promises of God in Him, in Christ, are yes, and in Him, amen, unto the glory of God. And so we're reminded today that all that God has spoken is true. Every word God has spoken over your life is 100% truth. Without fail, 
And we are reminded in this text that we can count on God doing exactly what it is God says He will do. He is the Amen. Notice second and verse 14. We're told here that he is the faithful and true witness. So th this takes it a little step further for us. Not only, is, not only does Jesus say in verse 14 that he is the amen, but it takes it a step further. And, and he tells us that he is the faithful and true witness. That he is completely trustworthy. We don't have to worry about him lying to us or stretching the truth or telling a fib. Absolutely all he says is the perfect witness. Another verse, if you'd like to write this one down, is John chapter 3, verse 31. A powerful verse from John's gospel that says this, He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen, what he has heard, of that he testifies. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. And Jesus says to us, not only is he the amen, but he is the faithful and true witness. And, and this third phrase in verse 14 is so very important for the context of the church of Laodicea because Jesus says here that he is the beginning of the creation of God. And this is setting apart a proper view, a proper doctrine of Christology of who Jesus Christ is. He is the beginning of the creation of God. And this symbolizes really that Jesus, not that Jesus started at a point of time in history, but, but that Jesus himself is the source, the agent of all creation through which God created all that we see. And so for the church, if you notice next, for the church of Laodicea and the city of Laodicea, what is said in verse 14 is so important about who Jesus is. Because the church of Laodicea, they, they had a Christology problem. They had a problem in their doctrine and in their view of who Jesus Christ was. They, they struggled in this area. And uh, we, we put together some pieces from a few other verses in the New Testament that I'll share with you in just a moment. But, but this really was detrimental to the life of the church of Laodicea. Uh, for the church of Laodicea, their, their major problem is that they had an inaccurate view of who Jesus Christ was. And a lot of denominations in our culture today, a lot of other religions in our world today have this same flaw in their belief system. At our house today, or this week, we received a, a very nice handwritten note from a, a, precious, uh, a precious woman, I'm sure, in the East Columbia area and uh, sending a brochure about, about her church's belief system and it, and it all looks really good and it all sounds really good on the surface but, but at the root of their theology and I'm not going to call their name because I'm not trying to be critical but at the root of their theology and I can tell you this because in seminary I did a deep exegesis 50 pages on their Christology at the root of their Christology it is absolutely absolutely flawed. And any other religion that is labeled as false or heresy, there are always two characteristics. They either add or take away to the Word of God, or they add or take away to who Jesus is. In every other belief system, in the three uh, world religions, in other belief systems that are prominent in our nation, that is always the defining factor. What they teach about the Word of God and what they teach about Jesus. 
And this church in Laodicea had a Christology issue. In fact, here's how we know. Uh, If you'll hold your finger in the book of Revelation and glance back a few books to the book of Colossians, we, we see a very unique connection between the book of Colossians that Paul authored We see a very unique connection to the book of Colossians and to the church of Laodicea. I've never seen this in scripture. I'm embarrassed to say that I missed it uh, until this week. But in Colossians chapter 4, and by the way, Colossians is a tremendous book, letter to the church of Colossae about who Jesus is. The the Christology we see in Colossians chapter 1 is uh, certainly has to be ranked among the highest of the teachings in scripture about what we know as to who Jesus is. And so Paul is writing the book of Colossians to set apart Christ, to teach about uh, the proper doctrine of who Jesus is And look what Paul includes, Colossians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea, and also Nympha and the church that is in her house, verse 16. When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you for your part read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. And so there is a strong connection between the doctrine that Paul is is writing about and teaching to the early church, specifically the doctrine of who Jesus is, and he connects this to the church of Laodicea. And uh, we are told about this church in Laodicea that, uh, that they had an extreme problem in the words of Christ with being lukewarm. Now, let me just give you a really quick background of the city. And I'll try not to give you too many boring details here, but, I, but it is important for the context. And so let me share with you just a couple of things about the city of Laodicea and their water supply, which, uh, by the way, Um, The population of Laodicea grew rapidly uh, because it was a a hub of a city, so to speak, for many reasons connected to Rome. And and so really the uh, local streams in Laodicea were no longer able to adequately supply the necessary water. And so what they did is they built this amazing aqueduct that was underground. Uh, They put it underground so that the enemies would not be able to get access to it. Uh, There are a couple of rivers here. Uh, One of those rivers would often dry up during the dry season. And most of the springs in the area of Laodicea were full of grasses and other chemicals that were not appropriate for a source of drinking water. And so really there was no choice by the city of Laodicea other than to pipe in water from distant springs through twin lines of stone pipe. And so there was a huge issue with their water source and water supply. And so we relate this in verse 15, and Jesus says this, as you notice next, his concern with the church of Laodicea. We've we've read the text, but Jesus says this in verse 15. Here's his concern. He says, I know your deeds. And unlike many of the other churches we've looked at, there's really not much good that Jesus has to say about this church of Laodicea. And he simply says, I know your deeds. And look what he says. He says, I know that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold. The strongest words perhaps he's ever said to a church, I will spit you out of my mouth. 
for sure, the most strong statement the Lord Jesus has said to any church. He is essentially saying to them, you make me vomit. I know you. I know who you are. You make me sick and you are lukewarm. And so uh, what we need to understand then is that these two water sources that I mentioned to you earlier, uh, one uh, included a cold stream uh, that, that made its earliest settlement in the area, and this was distant from the city. Uh, the waters were refreshing and clear. And contrary to that, the waters in Laodicea that flowed through those aqueducts that I mentioned earlier, it wasn't really hot enough to relax or restore, and it wasn't cold enough to quench. Therefore, it was foul water, and it made the people nauseous. And so Jesus uses the re reality of their situation concerning water and he equates that to their spiritual lives. And what we know about the history of the church of Laodicea is that their spiritual problem uh, at, at its root was what they believed about Jesus. He goes a step further in verse 17 and notice with me the call he issues. And I want us to spend our remaining time today hearing this call that he issues to the church of Laodicea. It is quite a gracious call, actually. And, and, and we do serve a gracious God. Amen? We serve a gracious God who, in spite of our failures and shortcomings... And we see this in the church of Laodicea. In spite of all of their failures, he issues this gracious call to them. In spite of these harsh words that he has spoken to them, he issues this call in verse 17. He clarifies to them and says, Because you say, I am rich, and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are, he says, their true condition, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Look at verse 18. He says to them his gracious call. I advise you. And if the Lord Jesus advises something, we should listen. Amen? And so he advises, he says in verse 18, Buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Look, look at this gracious call he is given. He's saying to them, I, I advise you to, to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves. He is talking about those things that are of utmost importance spiritually speaking. It's kind of like that verse, if you want to write this one down, this is really good, from Isaiah 55, verse 1. That verse in which the Lord says there in Isaiah 55, 1, Come without money and without price and buy. How is it that we're able to buy something when we have no money? And yet the Lord says, Come without money and, and buy from me without price. Because the reality is, is that God has provided everything we need and the most important things we need are, are those things, spiritually speaking. And so, so that invitation in Isaiah 55 verse 1 is similar to what he is advising in Revelation 3 verse 18. Come to me and buy the true tested gold so that you will not be poor anymore. And come to me and receive a white garment that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. The Lord is saying get rid of your dirty robes and come to me and get a white robe which represents righteousness and purity. And by the way, when we stand before God one day, all that really matters is how we are clothed, spiritually speaking. 
to the church of Laodicea that had that Christology problem, he is saying to them that it is only in Jesus that we will be able to stand before God spiritually clothed in his righteousness. And that is, by the way, all that matters at the end of our lives when we take our last breath here and when we stand before a holy God in heaven, he is going to look at us and to see are we bringing to him garments of works and self-righteousness and all of the good efforts that we seek to earn favor with God or are we just simply showing up clothed in the righteousness of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And so that is the heart of the matter for the church of Laodicea. And for us, Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10 says this, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation, the most important garments that any of us can wear today, spiritually speaking. Now, this is better than any sale you will ever get at Kohl's, right? Anybody else love those 30% coupons at Kohl's? This is better than anything that you can buy at Kohl's. This is better than anything that you can buy at your local Belk. This is better than any piece of clothing that you can put on a charge card this being clothed clothed with garments of salvation Isaiah 61:10 verse says verse 10 says for he has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness and so Jesus is saying to them in verse 18 come to me and I'll make you see I'll, I'll give you salve to anoint your eyes that you might See, I'll never forget as a 14-year-old young man after receiving Jesus Christ as my personal Savior the year prior. I tried my best to read the book of Genesis, understood absolutely nothing. And at the age of 14, after trusting in Jesus, receiving him into my life, I remember opening the same Bible and it was like, wow, I can see, I can understand. And it is that, that, that salve, that eye salve in verse 18 to anoint your eyes so that you might be able to see. What a spiritual blessing that God is offering to the church of Laodicea and that he's offering to you and to me today. And so I ask you today, in clothing like the church of Laodicea, I ask you today, have you allowed, in verse 18, have you found that gold, as Jesus says in verse 18, that gold that money absolutely cannot buy? It is that, that faith that has been refined by the purifier himself. It is that, that eternal gold that will last for all Eternity. By the way, we worship gold here on earth, and God says in heaven we're going to walk on streets of gold. Amen? He says, I advise you to buy from me that gold which is refined by fire. Those are those, those spiritual qualities that God is working in your life through hardship, through trial, through temptation, even through suffering. We've learned so much from the book of Revelation, even through persecution. These are the things that God is working in your life to refine the pure gold that money cannot buy. He says, verse 18, so that you may become rich and white garments, that you may clothe yourself, that the shame of your nakedness go all the way back to Genesis 3, the shame of Adam and Eve in the garden when they realized at first after they had sinned that they had no clothing. It was the shame that was brought to them because of their sin. And here what a glorious offer that Jesus is offering to you and to me to clothe us in his righteousness. And look what happens. He says, verse 20, the invitation is this. Uh, he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. You know, we use this verse that, that Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. And he is knocking at the door of our heart. Literally speaking, though, because of their Christology, he was outside of the church. 
And literally in verse 20, he's saying, let me in the church. Just as he's saying to you today, let me in your life and in your heart. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him. That is the absolutely best meal we can eat is the one that Jesus eats with us. Amen? And he is offering to come into our church and into our lives and to dine with us. And he says, he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. And I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And I ask you today in verse 22, do you have the spiritual ears to hear? Because Jesus closes this chapter and these messages to the seven churches by saying, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And I invite you in closing today to hear loud and clear his voice as he speaks to your heart and as he speaks to us as a church as we sing together this closing hymn, number 206, Blessed Be the Name. Would you stand with us as we sing today? Thank you so much for your presence here today. I pray God's richest blessings upon each of your lives. As we're dismissed, dismissed today, two quick things. Uh, first of all, our fellowship time is downstairs, so we invite you to stay for a cup of coffee for a refreshing uh, time together of fellowship prior to moving to our Sunday school classes at 11.15. Also, after the postlude today, we, we need to have a brief church conference uh, for an item of business that we need to present to the church for your consideration. Uh, we will actually vote upon this order of business next Sunday. So for any of our church members, uh, if you could just, uh, after the benediction and after the postlude, please just remain for a couple
couple of quick moments so that we can present this item of business to you. And then any of our guests or visitors, uh, you're free to be dismissed after the benediction for a time of fellowship downstairs. So it has been good to be in the house of the Lord together. And I leave you with this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace. God bless you today. Thank you for being with us. Thank you.